Okay, today on the show, our guest is top 1% producer and coach and author Grant Muller with Compass in Denver, Colorado. Let me tell you more about Grant. Now, Grant Muller is a speaker, author, certified high performance coach, and realtor on a mission to help real estate agents achieve more without endless hustle. Now, after becoming a millionaire before the age of 30, Grant fell into a downward spiral that caused him to lose everything. Moving past addiction and homelessness, he built a remarkable real estate career as a consistent seven-figure earner. And Grant knows what it takes to sell, and it all starts with a heart centered approach. And his new book, Top of Heart, tells the story of how he went from homeless to over $1 million in gross commission income. Please help me welcome Grant Muller. Grant, welcome to the show. Thank you, DJ. I'm looking forward to our conversation. And by the way, for everyone, I want everyone to do a couple of things. First, go to Grant's website, grantmuller.com, G-R-A-N-T-M-U-L-L-E-R.com. You can learn about all things Grant. He's an author. He's a coach. He has some free courses for you as well. So go to grantmuller.com. You can find it on Amazon. By the way, it has a perfect five-star review from all the people that have reviewed it. And it's not just like friends have reviewed it. Lots of people have reviewed this and they've all given it a perfect five stars. And uh, it's an awesome book. So please go on Amazon and purchase it. We'll have a link to both Grant's website, uh, all of his social accounts, as well as a link to buy the book right in our show notes. But anyway, Grant, thank you again for being on our show. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I think after that introduction, there's nowhere but nowhere but down for me. Uh, so I, really I like to set up my guests for failure. I'm like, yeah. this is this is the mountain I've put you on, and now let's topple you over. You know, <laughs> I, I am. Um, I, I you and I, you and I, when I I didn't. Uh, fortunately, I have not dealt with. understand uh you know we uh, sort of you know it's, oh i'm sorry are we uh i am cutting out aren't we okay my apologies am i still no. cutting out grant yeah you you're better now but you that's the second time you went out so oh boy if, yeah we might yeah have we're having for everyone listening i apologize this is a comcast issue for our our entire business is dealing with this so um, if this continues, I won't know. So Grant, will you tell me if I keep cutting out yeah. and then if we need to reschedule, yeah. if it's bad enough where we can't do it. So, um, yeah. we'll try to fix this That's in post, cool. but, um, let me know if it's, if it's unlistenable and we'll just, we'll re redo it for next week. So my apologies. Um, no worries. Oh, now, now everything looks good again. So we'll see. You look great. Oh, the internet. It's fun. Um, you for grant for telling me that so so yeah so i want to hear your story because i what i'm always most impressed with is people who pull themselves up it, it's it's not even about uh failing because everybody fails everybody makes mistakes everyone has hard challenges in life but it's it's the resiliency that is that is built you know the from the ashes right it's this strength and 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 um, resiliency that comes out of of tragedy that i am always so drawn to um and so i'd love to hear your story about how how you you know overcame the obstacles that have showed up in your life sure absolutely uh very quickly early on uh as as a kid really I learned how to pretend to be someone I'm not to fit in and uh, to, to get along with everybody. And it was a lesson I learned very early on. And as I got older, I kept pretending to be someone I'm not just to kind of make it and to fit in. And uh, in middle school, I uh, started drinking. And by high school, middle I Middle school. That's amazing. That's, that's a really early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was late middle school, but it was middle school. And yeah. by high school, I was drinking every day and I somehow made it through high school. And as I went into the workforce, I started to figure out that workaholism has way better side effects than alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of cold turkey quit drinking for a while and I worked like a madman. And I uh, was a stockbroker at Charles Schwab and a year into that job, I was given a team of 24 stockbrokers to work under me. I was actually the youngest uh, manager they'd ever um, promoted. 
So I had incredible success. A year later, I was the senior manager of a department with 60 people in it. And then shortly after that, I got recruited to an internet startup. Now, this is the late 90s. So <laughs> internet startup was just, this it was, was everything. It was of, everything. I, absolutely, that tech boom. And it was a software company that was starting an internet services division in Denver. And um, which really dates it, right? Because now internet is everything. It's not a division. Yeah. And I was hired as the head of service because I love customer service, consumer service. And that's what I've been doing at Schwab. They hired me as the head of service. I showed up at my colleague's apartment where our first Denver office was, her living room. And I said, hey, I'm the head of service. And she said, well, great. We have no clients. So you're also the head of sales. <laughs> And I said, well, what, what are we selling? And they said, well, we don't really know yet, but this internet thing is getting really big and we need to figure out how we use our software for the internet. We want you to go find our first 50 beta clients and let them help us design the product. So we found the first 50 beta clients. We went public, we all got rich. And, you know, Porsches and Ferraris started showing up in the parking lot. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was catered. I had a foosball table right outside my office. This is before Google, before it was cool to show up to work in holy jeans. We were doing it. And it was really cool, except I remember the night that we went public and I was in my fancy condo overlooking the skyline of Denver. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I've done it. I met my goal. I'm a millionaire by 30. But I thought, is this it? Is this all there is? I was miserable. I was uh, unhappy. I didn't like who I was. And I was still pretending to be someone I wasn't at this internet company, pretending to be kind of the tech bro. But it wasn't who I was. And so I think sometimes when we go after goals for the wrong reasons, in this case, to make me feel better about myself, when we get those goals and they don't fill that hole, it's just devastating. And that's what happened to me. I started drinking again. And within a few months, I tried cocaine for the first time. And a few months after that, I was fired because I was a daily cocaine user from the very first moment I started. Yeah. And so I went downhill very, very quickly. But no problem. I'm 28. I'm a millionaire, in at least in stock options. And I kept partying. I didn't worry about it. I thought, this is great. I don't have a job now to get in the way of the endless party. I was spending about $30,000 a month on cocaine, partying, various trips. And one day, one of my checks bounced. And I thought, oh, it's kind of weird. I need to exercise more shares. You know, when you're spending $30,000 a month on partying, you don't really sit down to balance your checkbook. <laughs> uh, in all honesty, I still don't balance my checkbook. <laughs> And so I called up to exercise more shares and they said, Mr. Mueller, we don't see any stock options in this account. And I said, that's all right. Obviously there's a misunderstanding. I have 16,000 shares of stock options. Go look again. Well, it turned out I had 90 days to exercise the shares after I left the company. And because I hadn't, I forfeited about oh. $1.2 million of stock options in a moment. Everything was gone. And uh, we liquidated the cars. We bought Coke with the liquidated cars. We did the Coke. Within a week from then, the cars were gone, the Coke was gone, the friends were gone. And I was left in this condo, miserable, pretty close to broke, with no real prospects. And um, long story short, uh, I was foreclosed on a few months later, and I spent the next few years, either couch surfing or in the end, living on the streets. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, luckily, things got bad enough for me um, that I was super desperate to do whatever it took to get clean and sober. Um, and I believe that's often what addicts need to get clean and sober is the willingness to do whatever it takes. And it was bad Absolutely. enough for me. I was supposed to go to prison for four years and through um, what I believe was some kind of spiritual in intervention, as well as a really loving family that didn't give up on me, I ended up going to 30 days of rehab and probation instead. And um, yeah, so that 
so really quickly, because I know your question is going to be, well, that's great, but how did you end up in real estate? Uh, so I had always wanted to be a realtor. I had bought some investment properties along the way, and I had really had a less than favorable opinion of the service I was getting from most of the realtors. Being a guy that was doing consumer services for a living, I thought there was an opportunity to really professionalize and to really add some intention and beauty to the customer service process that I didn't see. And so I'd never wanted to give up those great jobs though, to become a realtor. So now it's 2008, I'm living in a storage unit and the market is at the very bottom. My life is at the very bottom. And I think, well, yeah. what better time than now? So that's how I ended up being a realtor. What And you got in it possibly the you could argue one of the most challenging times in real estate, you know, back in 2008, 2000 to 2010, that was a huge crash for those of us that were alive during that time or remember were practicing during that time. Um, although I, I, I might say, I, I might suggest that could have been a great time to get in only because there were a lot of people exiting the business around that time as well, because it was so challenging to be a realtor during those those years. So I imagined kind of a trial by fire scenario where you probably got amazing training during those the, the, that time um, as people were, were fleeing the market, which isn't too dissimilar from what's happening even today. We're seeing a lot of agents leave the industry 2023 here. Rates are high, of course. Uh, inventory is is lower than than in most markets. So we, we're having we're seeing people exiting the business, and we're seeing the agents who are really stepping on the gas, picking up that market share. Um, but I, I want to just dial go all the way back to something that you said at the very beginning that. I, I want to just make a point of, because I've had a similar experience and, and Grant was talking about once you achieve some major goal that he had this, is this all there is moment. And I had a similar experience just a few years ago. I had always wanted to write and I had a much, much uh, smaller um, sort of goal, but my, my lifetime dream was to write a funny article to be published in a, in a humor magazine. And that was always kind of my thing. And there weren't any humor magazines for a long time. National Lampoon was kind of the place I wanted to to do that with, but they went out of business. Anyway, then uh, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, I think three or four years ago, to actually get published in a magazine like that. And it was a big deal for me. It was kind of like my life's ambition was just to be recognized with a piece of humor. And I remember that day being one of the saddest days of my life, and I couldn't quite figure out why. And I remember going, well, this is a bummer. I thought this was going to be the best day of my life. And I was very honored and I was great. And I, it was a good piece. And I'm really proud of the work that I did and, and it got published. I'm super proud of it. But I was also horribly depressed. And I think that is a very common thing that all of us need to realize that that you know we, we sometimes we look for some external event. It's like, that's going to be the thing. If I could just achieve that, if I could just get you know, whatever the goal is, then I'll be happy. And what you find out, at least what I found out, is that it was the journey was really was really the real benefit. When I actually achieved the goal, I actually got really depressed. So it was like, oh, the juice isn't when I achieve the goal. The juice is all the work I did up to it. Um, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Just I just wanted to touch on that before we get into you know everything else. No, it's a super important theme, and it's one that runs through my coaching. It runs through, through the book, runs through a lot of the work that I do. I really believe that achievement comes from fulfillment, not the other way around. Yeah. So when we are fulfilled, fulfilled when we uh, appreciate who we are, maybe we don't always like every part of who we are, but when we love ourselves and we appreciate who we are, we appreciate the journey that we're on, and we bring some joy to our daily existence, achievement will flock to us. And uh, just to put it in real estate agent terms, when we go to a listing appointment and we're solid about who we are and the value that we deliver, and we love being there simply for the act of being there and finding a way to serve the person that we're meeting with, it's much more likely we'll get the listing. Fulfillment is where the achievement comes from. 100%. I, I always think like outcome is kind of up to the gods. Like the outcome uh, is is up to things that are largely 
for the most part, outside of our control. Sometimes things fall our way, sometimes they don't. And we can, you know, improve our skill to have them fall more likely our way than, than not. Uh, but at the end of the day, the one thing that we always have control over is our effort, our actions. And if we can derive fulfillment and pleasure from the work itself, then the actual goal becomes less significant, right? It becomes about the work and the work ultimately leads, you know, you're going to get the goals anyway, but what's nice is you don't have to live and die by the goals. You live and die by the work. At least that's the way I, I've uh, just tried to live my life. Absolutely. It's so much more fun that way too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. A lot less stress. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, I want, let's talk, let's talk about, uh, so, so let's talk about real estate. So you, you know, and I want to talk about the book as well, top of heart, which, you know, again, is, is a take on the expression top of mind. You know, we, we think, oh, I want to keep our clients. We always want to be top of mind. Well, we actually want to be top of heart. And, and I am, um, super interested in learning about what that means to you and how you, um, keep yourself a top of heart with your, with your clients and how you train agents to do the same. In 2008, I got, I got a job at the front desk of a real estate office, nine bucks an hour, living in a storage unit. After being a millionaire, lost everything. Yeah. Now you're back at the bottom. Yeah. But I, but to me, it was amazing. I went to a, I got to go to a clean place to work instead of the life I had been living on the street. So it was fancy to me. Sure. Uh, I remember just thinking the glass doors were all so clean. I mean, everything was so pristine. Uh, it was a big deal to me just to be inside. Um, just to have water or soda when I wanted it was a huge deal to me. It wasn't hard to impress me. And I I learned from being at the front desk a little bit about while I was getting my license, I noticed agents that did well and agents that didn't and what they had in common. And a lot of them had um, this ability to just be, they were just, they seemed to be the ones that I looked forward to when they came through the, the door of the office. They were the ones I looked forward to seeing. Those were also the same ones that seemed to be have the higher production. And I didn't quite put all of it together yet, but I know now those are the people that when they reach out to their clients, the clients want to hear from them. Yeah. And so I, uh, I got, the, but it took me a moment. And this was 2009 when I got my license, I started running Craigslist ads for foreclosure properties and did the direct marketing route. And um, I was calling Anybody who left a phone number, I was calling, beating them up, reading the sales script to get an appointment. And I eventually fell upon a few clients. And at one point, I got a phone call from somebody. This is after I'd done four or five deals. And they said, hey, so-and-so referred me to you. I'd like you to help me buy a house. I heard you're a great agent. And I started taking them through the sales script. And they stopped me and said, no, no, you don't, there's no need for that. <laughs> you already got the sale. <laughs> you got the sale. Whoa, bro. Like back off. Stop selling. <laughs> Let's just meet. And I thought, oh, is this what they've been talking about when they say real estate's a relationship business? This is kind of cool. And that was my first referral, uh, client referral. And now 98% of my business is repeat clients and referrals from clients. And I just fell in love with that process. And there were some times along the way, and I won't get into all that now, but where I thought, well, if I'm going to do relationships, I'm going to do relationships on a huge scale so I could build a huge business. And I kind of, I went up some peaks and valleys along that journey. But what I finally started to figure out, I was in recovery meetings at night, sure. learning how to get real for the first time in my life, to get real with who I am, my circumstances, the challenges I had. But then during the day, I was learning some top of mind tactics. And by the way, I think top of mind is great. But I was learning some tactics that didn't feel congruent to who I was. Hmm. And I felt like I was going to have to pretend to be someone I wasn't, you know, to have a really nice, friendly phone conversation. And then at the end to say, oh, by the way, who do you know that might need to buy a house (laughs) in the next three to six months? And I thought, that old chestnut. (laughs) <laughs> oh, man. And I thought, am I going to have to pretend to be someone I'm not again to make it in this business? And I was virtually unemployable at this time. So I had to make it work. So I did some of that. But I started to learn along the way that when I created real, genuine, emotional connections and relationships with clients and with people in my sphere, referrals started to happen almost like it was magic. And so what I like to say is that the no like and trust at top of mind is absolutely a great place to start. It just doesn't go far enough. 
And so that's where top of heart comes from. So it's no like and trust is top of mind. And then on top of top of mind, so building upon that model is top of heart. And top of heart is the mindset, the skill set, and the heart set. And the mindset is to get real, to be who we really are. This is short version. But once we're real with who we really are and we're creating great relationships, it's not, it's good, but what if we're not really good at what we do? What if we don't have the skill sets or the habits to follow through on what we need to do? We used, you and I were chatting before about consistency. What if you don't have the consistency to do the things? So you've got to have the skill sets. And then heart set is all about how do we get present? How do we get connected? How do we build a community of people um, that, that we can be a part of, that we can lead, and that we can serve. And that will then, of course, also serve our business. And so it's mindset, skill set, heart set is top of heart. I love that. Those are all super important. And I, I think, you know, we, we you're right. Top of mind is better than not being in someone's head. But being in their heart is really where you can live forever. And then you have this ability to really connect with somebody at a deep level. And in real estate, you are helping people make deep emotional decisions. These are difficult financial decisions. They're obviously big financial decisions and they're typically pretty emotional. And so I think, you know, you're so absolutely right that yes, we want to connect at a deep level emotionally. We also want to make sure our core competency, our skill level is actually, you know, good so that we can, you know, support and, and, and treat our clients in the way that we need. Um, and, and then also just running a business. You're, you're doing a, wearing a lot of hats as a realtor. So what are some of the ways in which you suggest agents start to think about sort of penetrating into their clients' hearts? Great question. You know, in, I, I think a lot of us try to follow the rules and, and we're raised to follow the rules, to do what's expected of us, you know, to keep relationships kind of safe and secure and a little superficial. And in business and sales and real estate, it's like that even more. And these, these top of mind tactics really, they keep us in front of rather than with people. So we, we really learn in real estate and think about some of the real estate coaching classes or classes you've taken. They really teach us to stay relevant in people's minds rather than real with people. Right. And, you know, that's over. That, that world is done. The age of putting up the business front, it's done. It, playing, you know, playing numbers games and calling human beings targets or prospects um, I think it's time we bring the humanity back to business and that we really treat people as human beings. And so to answer your question very directly, I think one of the greatest gifts we can give another human being is to allow them to be seen and appreciated as they really are. Um, therapists call this positive, um, um, I'll think about it just a second here, unconditional positive regard is what, a, what therapists call it. And when I came across that term, I said, oh, yeah, that's it. So how do we hold people and hold space for them and allow them to be seen and feel safe as they really are? That's an incredible gift we give another human being. And when we do that, then we start to enter that heart space. And when we get real and we show up as we really are, now instead of a me and you thing, we're a we thing. Right. And when we create that relationship at that level with somebody, and by the way, this doesn't have to be a friendship. Don't get me wrong. We don't have to have a bunch of pretender friends. This, this, not all of my clients are friends with me, but we connect in some way emotionally. And that's the difference between somebody saying, yeah, I've got somebody you, know, you can use as a realtor if they're asked versus somebody just hearing somewhere about real estate across the room and going, you got to call DJ or I'm never yeah. talking to you again. Right. Right. That's head to head to heart. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's absolutely right. You, you know, you, you said something very important, which is about letting a creating a space where someone can be authentically themselves. It's like, okay, what does that actually mean? What what I think it the way that I interpret that is providing um, a safe, non judgmental place. Where, for example, if I'm a realtor and I have a client, where a client can, you know, uh, 
express their emotions. They can talk about what their experience is buying, selling, you know, getting ready to buy or sell any part of the process. There's an expression in a, in a men's group that I'm, um, a part of called all of you is welcome. So yes. it's it's a very similar sort of idea yes. Grant, from what you were saying, which is bring all of you to this. You don't have to be a certain way. You just have to be. And I, as the agent will be here to allow you to be, and I will help guide you through this process. Is that kind of the way you, you think about it? Yes, absolutely. And I think the way that we create that permission is that we lead the way. So we bring all of who we are. We get clear about our own beliefs and our own strengths and our own values so that we bring all of us to the transaction. Now, by the way, um, I'm not suggesting some kind of, I'm not a therapist. So guess what? I don't have to just take every client and give them unconditional positive regard. I can have lunch or coffee with somebody and think, you know what? I'm going to love them from a distance. I, I don't think that they're a great fit for me. So because I invest so much time and energy into the relationships for the people that are in my community, uh, what people call it their sphere, I call it my community, and I invest a lot of time and energy and love there. So you have to be somebody that I genuinely want to serve. And honestly, that's not most people. Yeah. So I have a process for meeting people and kind of letting them audition to be a part of my community. I don't tell them they're auditioning, of course, that would be terrible, but it's just a, a, you know, a way to think about it. And so, so I'll add somebody to my just met tag in my CRM to put this to tactics level. And then I'll invite them to coffee and I'll get to know them. And it's not about judging them. It's not about being friends or not. It's about, do we click? Yeah. Do we, do we have some common values? Do we click in some way? Is it easy? And do I have energy um, when I leave them or have they drained my energy? That's, that's it. It's a really important stuff. And, and I, I, it could not agree more. It's like we, we have such a really uh, huge opportunity in this industry where it's such an interpersonal business, real estate, and it allows us to really work on our ability to deeply connect with other humans. Yes, we have to be great realtors. We have to have the skill sets to, to actually perform the duties our clients entrust upon us, but also this idea of it's, it's bigger than that, right? So, so, you know, a lot of emotion goes into these, uh, sort of, uh, you know, transactions and relationships need to be pretty solid, uh, to help guide somebody through. And so what you're really talking about is, is building intimacy. It sounds like, you know, when you're, you're meeting with, or, or, or determining if they're, you know, what level of intimacy and intimacy yes. is, is, is not a scary word, but it's just about connection. You know, we're yeah. talking about connection and when people feel connected, um, they, they, like you said, they shout across the room. Oh my gosh, you, you need a realtor. Talk to, talk to Grant. And, and understanding what the person across the table needs from us. Uh, I have, I wrote about a senior citizen uh, in my book who, you know, every time I went to her, I needed to add another hour to that time because she needed that space um, to share some of her life story. It became a, you know, it became a huge lesson for me. Uh, I learned so much from her and I learned to slow down and to, to realize that everyone has a story that could be valuable. The lady that I had lunch with today, right before this, she needs 25 minutes for lunch. Bing, bang, boom, out. She wants to see me. She wants to hear me. She wants to tell me what she needs. You know, she's kind of a networker and we want to exchange some value real quick. She's very business minded. And then she's out the door. Those two people need something very different. Uh, I had a client once, once who uh, unfortunately lost her son in an avalanche. And I ended up having lunch with her. She didn't cancel the appointment. I didn't know anything about this. Wow. And she cried through most of lunch. Sure. And I, I didn't know. I had no value to add. I have no children. I have not lost somebody in that way. Um, but I created the space to allow her to have the space. And so I think it's about understanding what people need from us and meeting them where they're at. Yeah. And, and, and not, and you're right. You can have, I always think there's a distinction between judgment and preference, right? So we can allow yes. people to be authentically themselves, which means you are free to express yourself as you are. Um, 
and uh, and I, I just lost my my own trade. Oh, uh, but but I may still have a preference. So I can still have a preference that oh that person I connect with better than this person. It doesn't mean that person's good, bad, indifferent. It just means I like you were saying. Do we do our energies connect? And yeah. that's really what you're ultimately looking for in a client. Um, what are what are some of the ways in which you determine whether your energies connect when you're like you were saying you you have a just met. Uh, person in your in your database you yeah. take them out for coffee and and how do you then proceed from there it's a feeling i i wish i could use i wish i could give you some smart matrix i use but uh you know i generally know it's well i'll put it this way i treat those relationships like i do any other relationships in my life we all know if we want to continue a relationship with someone or not so i allow that that relationship to follow its natural course. And a lot of times, and in my life at least, I'm a bit more of an introvert. I'm a bit of an acquired taste. So a lot of times for me, the natural course of a relationship is I meet somebody and it maybe doesn't really go anywhere right away. That's just not who I am necessarily. So if it's easy and it feels like it clicks, then, then I'll know it. And so I just treat business relationships like I do regular relationships. I just treat them like real relationships. And that sounds so simple. Uh, it's taken a lot of work for me. That's why I had to write a book about it to kind of figure out what the process is. But, um, but I had to get really clear about who I am and what my values are. And then it's easier for me to look for similar values or at least values that are adjacent um, aligned is best, but if they're even adjacent, that's great. Um, you know, you might love serving a certain underrepresented population um, in your nonprofit work. That's very different than the population I love to serve, but we have the same heart for service. And so then that would be, a, 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 you know, something that we have in common that we can then put to work in our relationship. So, so common, common beliefs, values, strengths are uh, really valuable. <laughs> And it's important for, I think, one thing, I would put this in the soft skills category, but for equally as important as any of the harder skills uh, category is really thinking about who your ideal, everyone listening, who is your ideal client? And I know there's lots of different categories of clients. Not everyone is going to fit in the same in the same bucket. But what kind of clients do you, meaning the listeners, um, do you resonate with? Who do you like? Do you like working with people that are the data-driven, you know, just want to see the numbers, non-emotional, you know, sort of um, more empirically, objectively based people? Or is it more of the deeper connecting, touchy-feely types or somewhere in between? And obviously there's a million different personality types. But thinking about what you resonate with, what lights you up, Mr. or Mrs. Listener, uh, here um, is thinking about what what you're looking for, in, and the same thing you do if you're looking for a romantic partner, a business a partner, a friend. I mean, these are really important questions to ask yourself because what what your brain can start to do is start to filter and look and start to seek those people out. Um, but you don't know until you know what you're looking for. So I think what you're saying, Grant, it's so it, it's a simple thing to say, but it's it really profound. And something that people can do over and over again is start thinking about who, if I could design my ideal client, what would they look like? Uh, what what would how would they respond? How would they act? Now nobody's perfect, so you can't don't create a perfect human being because no that doesn't exist. But if you get some of the certain qualities that you look for, you know how agreeable are they? How de how decisive are they? These are things that you should be looking for so that you can you know better communicate with these people. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, you know, I tend to get along with a lot of different personality types, but for me, I look for. Um, some common shared interests so sure. or goals. So I'm really big into horses and many of my clients are horse people. And the cool thing is I get to go do the thing that I love the most in the world. And by doing that, I naturally meet people who also love this thing I love the most in the world. And so now instead of us sitting across the table looking at each other, we're on the same side of the table sharing in this, in this thing we love together and what builds better connections than sharing something you love together? And then when we do the real estate thing, the real estate thing is almost like a side note. 
it's like we have a lovely day together and then it's oh by the way can you would you call me sometime we actually um, want to have you over look at the house you can help me sell sell it. Is, do you still do that right yeah i do that cool and that's that it's that simple and when it happens in that flow it's just it's beautiful the other monday morning two weeks ago uh i rode i rode horses um through this beautiful beautiful ranch property with one of my best clients and a person who's a great friend and we had a beautiful what a great monday morning and just trust me when i say the numbers are super lucrative so how you know how beautiful is it to bring all of those things together and i think that's a big reason why i get to do the numbers i do without burning out because i'm not pretending to be someone i'm not i'm living congruent with my values and i'm having a great time along the way and that's a lot of what my coaching is about is helping people define a business plan that works for who they really are so that they're not failing to implement somebody else's plan for them. Because I feel like we learn things that don't feel right for us, so then we don't follow through on them, and then we beat ourselves up and think there must be something wrong with us, and that's just no way to live. I, I agree. Let, let's talk about your coaching, um, because you, you, you just said a lot, and I was going to start heading down a different avenue and I realized I would be hijacking the entire uh, interview and I don't want to do that because I want to learn about what you actually uh, offer with respect to coaching. Um, so let's talk about Grant Muller. Uh, by the way, the, the web, uh, the book again is top of heart. Find it on Amazon anywhere. Books are are sold. We will have a link to that in the show notes. And grantmuller.com is where you can go to learn about the coaching program. But let's talk about coaching. So what does coaching mean to you? So in real estate and in most of the world, training is confused with coaching a lot. So training is around learning tools, tactics, strategies from another person who teaches us the method. We take that method and we follow through with that method, hopefully to get similar results. In coaching, we believe that you have the answer to the problem. So in my coaching, and specifically high-performance coaching, my job is to guide you to find your own truths. And sometimes those are emotional truths, sometimes those are business truths, but I want you to help you find your own truths. And I believe that personal development is business development. Jim Rohn, very, very old time, um, personal development guy used to say that, and it's so true. And we're in a business where we actually get paid better when we improve ourselves. What a blessing to be in that kind of business. If you're a CPA, you don't get to say that. So as we get, we are the product that we offer the community. And so when we improve ourselves, we improve our product, we improve our business. And so in high performance coaching, we work through five um, big habit areas that have been proven through the scientific study um, to be key components of high performance living and life. And high performance is around performing at a higher level in a sustained manner while improving our relationships and our wellness. So this is not peak performance where we kill ourselves on a hustle and grind, and then you know we end up petering out on the other side because we're exhausted, burned out, and unhappy. That's no fun. I like you know my story, you know, that I've been there, done that. Um, and I, I don't want to go back there. So this is around living a fulfilled inspired life and then we happen to do really well financially at the same time yeah it's, it's kind of an all things uh all things um improve uh i guess is is always the the intention and and always readjusting and, and recalibrating I, I know that for me like recently i i've been uh, doing too much service uh this sort of stuff with respect right. to the real estate industry. I, I, I give too much of myself. Um, and as a result, I'm a little bit out of balance. So it's a good problem to have. It's still a problem. So mm -hmm. as a result, um, I have to read stuff as well. And so having a coach, I think it, any part of your real estate journey or just per personal journey is, is going to be critical because you, you can have somebody who can see maybe the imbalances that, that you're currently stuck in and everybody's imbalanced at some, in some part of their life, right? No, no wheel is perfectly round. If it's, if it's representing somebody's entire life, no. there's going to be bumps along the way. So it's really nice that since we can't smooth out all of our own bumps ourselves, which would be great if we could, but we can't. So the good news is there's people that can help us 
uh, identify these bumps and smooth them, help us smooth them out our, ourselves as well, which is through coaching. And so I'm, I am the biggest fan of having a coach. I mean, every professional athlete has a coach and they're already really good at their job. So yeah. I'm assuming that the rest of us need coaches as well. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So right now it's 2023, we're halfway, th- a little bit past halfway through the year and you know, let's face it, it's a tough year right now. It's not, the sky is not falling. So that's good. Um, there's still business to be had, but it's not quite as busy as it was in previous years. We're all feeling that we all get it. Yes. It's a little bit of a bummer. So what are, what are, uh, Grant, what are you sort of uh, encouraging agents to do to stay, uh, productive, to stay positive, to stay, but also realistic, to also understand what, what's going on right now? There are many parts to that question. So uh, uh, you, it's a tougher year. And look, I'm, I'm down from where I wanted to be this year as well. So I'll be super transparent about that. By the way, by the way, everybody is. <laughs> so I, yes. Grant is not alone. Yes, yeah. there's exceptions. There's a few yeah. people out there who are like, my yeah. business is up. And yeah. 99% yeah. of us are, are struggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have I have a coaching client who's having his best year ever. And I'm I'm really proud of him. And yeah. I know I can see why. You know, he's been building the momentum big time. And uh, for me, you know, you don't put out a book uh, into the world and maintain great balance in all the other parts of your life. It just doesn't sure. happen. Uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, I, I made that conscious decision. So the first thing about that rounding out conversation that you had is that in coaching, we make intentional decisions rather than just letting things happen. So, you know, if you're going to take two weeks off from the gym to push this big project through, so be it. That's very different than looking back two weeks later and saying, what happened in my life? And so we try to be a little intentional about the trade-offs that happen, but absolutely there, need, there needs to be trade-offs. The second thing is when times get tough, I've always been taught and I always teach to look at the last 12 months of deals and make sure you're very clear about where that business has come from in its majority. If, you're, if you have a fairly busy real estate practice, likely most of it is repeat and referral, almost always is the case, not always. But whatever that thing is, whether it's Zillow leads or it's repeat and referral, find ways to double down on that. So if I usually reach out to my people in my sphere once a quarter, I might add in an extra email. I might make sure that I um, spend more time at lunch face to face with more people than I usually would. I might go a little deeper into my database than I usually would, but making sure that we're taking massive action. So that's number one. Number two, cutting back on expenses that aren't necessary. And I am the president of the fan club of expenses that aren't necessary. (laughs) Um, You know, I think it might have to do with just my background of not, you know, living on the streets and not having everything for a while. So when I started making money, believe me, I want it. If it's pretty and, and, and fun and expensive, I want to buy it, but now is not the time. And so understanding that, um, and the reason it's not the time is not necessarily because you won't make it through, although that could be the case. But more importantly, when we reduce the financial pressure for ourselves, then we don't show up with commission breath when we meet with clients. Yeah. We have the ability to say no. I said, I said no thank you yesterday to a listing. Um, you know, the seller said, you have the best program. So-and-so has the best price. Will you match the price? And I said, thank you for asking. No, thank you. And I can do that because I've reduced some of my expenses. And so I think when we reduce some of that pressure, we we give ourselves some room to breathe. And then we can look at things logically and say, last year, most of my business was repeat and referral. I did it through three big client events. They were really expensive. So this year, instead of that, I'm going to reach out and do a wine club. I'm going to do a day at the park with without all the fancy stuff or I'm gonna be together face-to-face with as many of these people as possible. Or I'm simply gonna text or Facebook Messenger and reach out and and find out how people are. But in one way or another, we need to get into massive action. I'd love to say there was some easy button, but that's just not the way it is. We've gotta get into some massive action, but in a clear, concise way with a plan, rather than flailing. I see a lot of agents, unfortunately, that do nothing 
because it doesn't feel like anything's going to make a difference. Right. Because we have a, a short term problem of cash flow. And real estate isn't a short term sales cycle, it's a long term sales cycle. So the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. But the second best time is now. So we have to get into massive action now. And I think what that does, I'll give you an example. In my case, this year, I'm okay treading water. I've had some other big goals. I'm going to tread water this year. But I know that just the very act of all the momentum required to tread water this year is going to give me a huge lift going into next year. Because now I've got that massive action program in place. So as 60, 70, 80,000 realtors exit the business, my market share and your market share is going up without doing anything. But if yep. we're in massive action this year, we'll improve even more when we get some wind in our sails. I was the other day with a top producer who was young, a young man. He's in his early thirties. I, I guess, I don't know if that's young anymore, but uh, to me, it's, it's young. young. Anybody under uh, 40 is young to me. Yeah. Sure. To me, to you and me, that's young. And he was saying, um, they were asking him, how do you, what are you doing right now to step on the gas? You know, what, what, what are you doing to stay top of mind, uh, in, in not top of heart necessarily, uh, what Grant could teach, but just at least top of mind. He says, you know what I do every day He goes, what I'm doing now is I'm sp- doubling the amount of time I reply to uh, Facebook and Instagram comments or, or posts. And I, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I, th- I thought, I wonder why he's doing that. And then I, I thought about it a bit. He goes, because, and, and he explained it. He said, because people post typically uh, on Facebook and Instagram, they post emotional parts of their lives, you know, typically victories, you know, things to celebrate, birthdays, you know, events, whatever, uh, special moments in their life, yeah, vacations, whatever. And so he goes, I want to celebrate with my clients. So I have to know what, what they're doing and they're going to post mostly post on Facebook or or wherever. So I want to let them know that I acknowledge that, that I see that they just did this great thing and I want to celebrate with them. So, and, and this is his personality. And he's like, so I write 30 comments a day. He goes, I've, you know, so many Facebook friends and Instagram friends, and I'm constantly just you know, giving validation, but he's like, it's authentic. He goes, I authentically, I'm excited that they went to Cancun or they just had this fancy dinner or their child just, you know, was in a recital or something. And, and he's like, you, he goes, that's where I'm stepping on the gas. And he goes, I do it every single day. I do minimum of 30 comments. And he goes, I, in a year or two, I will have more business than I know what to do with. And I said, you're probably right. I love that. And, and when you, when you jump in that big, you can have you can have the confidence that he has to yeah. say, I know that this is going to come through. A couple of things you said there, I have to jump in on. One Please. is he's allowing others to be seen, just like we were saying. He's giving them the gift of being seen. So number one, um, one great way to take that from a top of mind to a top of heart tactic is when we, and by the way, I love that he's doing it genuinely. If it wasn't genuine, it wouldn't work. Yeah, it would, it would be a bad idea. <laughs> We've all seen yeah. that. So if that's not you, find another way. Right. Uh, because because that's not for everybody. But uh, one of my favorite things to do, and admittedly, I don't do it as often as I could, but one way to go from top of mind to top of heart is to make the comment, congratulations, DJ, awesome on, you know, Mitzi passing this, I don't know, six-week um, obedient school, your dog, I'm making something up now, um, you know, great job. But the next level, the top of heart level is then put it, take it out of social media and put it in the real world. So send a handwritten card that says, congratulations on Mitzi on graduating from the six week obedience school thing. Um, and when we do that and take it out of social media and into the real world, it takes things to a whole nother level because there's so much friction in sending out actual mail. People know what a pain it is to get a stamp and get an envelope and put it all together and write the card. But when you can when you can create a system for that friction so it's not high friction on your end, i.e. I've got a whole card library over here, um, you just d- dash out a card, stamp, it goes in the mail. It's easy for you, but they can't believe it when they get it. They're like, wow, he really cares. You, um, you might even bring a tear to their eye through oh, yeah. a simple act of a greeting card uh, non-real estate related. Hey, saw you did no or branding. accomplished X or whatever. Congrats. So proud of you. You know, whatever. Just, it, I see you. I acknowledge you. I'm on, I'm in your camp and I want to celebrate with you or be there for you when you need help. Um, 
that is what every human being on the planet wants. Yeah, and it's it's and there's no branding, please, no logos, no yeah, um, no. W- send me the three people's names of no, no don't do that. No. And and then if you want to take it, and everything is in degrees. Uh, every everything everything that I think about is at different levels. So then I always like to ask the question. So then how can I? What's the next level of that? And the next level might be this would be ridiculous if your dog passed obedience school. But let's say that it's a bit. Let's say your daughter just graduated high school. Now I'm reaching out going, DJ, I don't know how you did that. I don't have any kids, but I can only imagine 18 years of getting a kid all the way through high school. When can we go out to dinner to celebrate? And now I'm taking you out to dinner. We're spending time together. Uh, We might talk a little bit about your daughter, but really we're just going to catch. It's an excuse to take you to dinner and it's an easy excuse. And it's just a way to honor you as another human being who's done something really incredible in this world. And so it feels good to me and it feels good to you. And hopefully your daughter comes along too. It's just, it's, it, that's top of heart. That's all top of heart is. I make my living that way. I'm not the most social person. So you don't have to do a lot of this, um, but do it with people that you actually click with. Then you look at your calendar and you're excited about how you're going to spend your day. You're not thinking, oh no, it's another two hours of prospecting time this afternoon. I don't want to do. That's just no way to live. Now it's, I'm calling my friends and seeing how they're doing. It's amazing. Yeah. And that, what a great place to, to wrap up this particular episode. Grant, I could talk to you all day about this and we, we definitely will have you back to talk more in depth, but the book is called top of heart guys. This is the key. Again, Grant said something very important earlier. He said, wouldn't it be cool if you were just seen as a guy that they have to meet and oh, by the way, you also do real estate. Right. So that's kind of Grant's whole thing is like you can just be an authentically you and people will will want to um, obviously tell other people about you and help you in your business. But you have to make space for that and you have to learn how to build those relationships. Grant's going to show you how. And I want to also make one point about Grant's book. He has a foreword or a blurb at least by Bob Berg, who is the king of referrals. This is the guy and he wrote a blurb for your book, Grant. So that is uh, I can't even imagine what kind of feather in that in in your cap it is, but it is a good feather. Bob Berg is the man, and if Bob Berg says that this is a book to read, it's a book to read. So I want everybody to go out. I've read all of Bob's books, I think. So anything Bob tells me to read, I read. And Bob says to read Grant's book, Top of Heart. We'll have a link to it on uh, in the show notes. And also, guys, you need a coach. Get a coach now is the time. Go to GrantMuller.com and. Grant will uh, reach out to you and see if you guys can work together in a coaching capacity. And on behalf of all of our our audience, we want to thank uh, Grant for coming on our show today. We appreciate you. Uh, Thank you for spending time out of your crazy busy day to do this. And on behalf of Grant and myself, we want to also thank the audience for making it to the end of the episode. And please, the best way you can help us continue to grow is by telling a friend. Think of one other realtor that's struggling right now. Every realtors are, uh, most realtors are struggling right now. So send them a link to this episode, keepingitrealpod.com. Every episode we've ever done can be streamed there. We're on all the social channels. Find us there as well. Hit the subscribe button. Leave us a review. Let us know what you think of the show. We will see you on the next episode. Grant, thank you so much. Uh, and we will uh, we'll see everyone next time. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Thanks very much.